holistic approaches to apologetics, two different ways in which you might try to deal with the atheist and defend your faith as he challenges you. The two approaches, as I told you at the end of our last session, are called natural theology on the one hand, and commonly the other one is called presuppositionalism. The presuppositional approach to defending the faith is the one which I recommend to you, the one which I hope is faithfully represented in these tapes of my debate with Dr. Stein. But this evening we're going to begin with an introduction to natural theology and a critique of it. Perhaps you'd like the definition of natural theology, and I would like the definition of presuppositionalism too, since I'm going to come to it second, let me define it first. If you follow that kind of logic, you'll be ready for everything I'm about ready to give you tonight. Now, by way of contrast, the presuppositionalist says that we prove God by showing the impossibility of the contrary. We prove God's existence by showing the impossibility of the contrary. That's an indirect form of argumentation that claims that if you do not begin with God, specifically with the Christian God, as he's revealed in nature and scripture, if you don't begin with God, then you destroy the intelligibility of our reasoning. So that without God, you can't prove anything. So the argument becomes, the proof for God's existence is that without him, you can't prove anything. We argue from the impossibility of the contrary. The contrary of Christianity, be it atheism or any non-Christian religion, what have you, will not provide a foundation for such things as logic or science or morality, so forth. So that we, we say you must presuppose God in order to reason at all. That would be a presuppositionalist approach, and I don't expect you to get all that and certainly not to understand it just by that quick presentation. But I'll give you the opposite and spend some time on this. The natural theological approach, or the approach that says we can base a theology on our knowledge of nature, natural theology says that by the correct use of reason and evidence, the unregenerate man can, without assistance, that is to say, can autonomously arrive at elementary religious truths. Let me say that again. By the correct use of reason and evidence, the unregenerate man can, without assistance, arrive at elementary religious truth. The correct use of reason, or as it's sometimes put, the reasonable use of reason, will enable the unregenerate man to autonomously prove such things as that probably a God exists. The mind of the natural man has sufficient rational powers to discover God on his own, based on his knowledge of the natural world. Natural theology is the source of what are traditionally called the theistic proofs. Natural theology attempts to offer certain proofs of God's existence. And there are many, many such proofs. I do think they come down to a handful of basic ones, but many variations of them. And I don't have time, nearly enough time in one hour, probably even to do all that I had outlined for myself, but I certainly couldn't go over all of them. I'm going to be looking tonight particularly at just one particular, I think the most popular form of proof of God's existence from the standpoint of natural theology, what's called the cosmological argument. The argument from our knowledge of the cosmos, our knowledge of the world self. All of us who are Christians believe the doctrine of creation. We believe this world is not self-sufficient. We believe this world is not eternal, that this world was created ex nihilo, from nothing, by the power of God. And so it seems to make sense to us when people propose the idea of proving God by saying, well, everything comes from something, and so where did the world come from? It must have come from God. There must be a cause that's the first cause, that wasn't itself cause, but it's the cause of everything else. Now that by no means is the sophisticated philosophical way of putting it, but I do want to at least get you on the right track. You, you get the idea of the cosmological argument in this, that such and such was caused by something before it, which was caused by something before it, and in the end we must come to a cause which itself was not caused, but has always existed or is self-sufficient in some way, and therefore it is 
the cause of everything else, or the first cause, and that's what we call God. Natural theology suggests that we can offer proofs of God's existence that can satisfy the unregenerate man as he demands to know on what basis we believe in God. So, how do you argue with an atheist? Natural theology says give him a proof of God's existence. The presuppositionalists will say we'll offer a proof too, but it will not be of the sort we've been talking about. A direct proof from something everybody will agree to, but rather it will be an indirect proof from the very procedure of proof itself. Natural theology says we can prove God's existence, and the first thing I want to say, I have about five major aspects of my critique of natural theology. The first thing I want to say about natural theology is that it's not clear to me what will count as a proof of God's existence. It's not clear to me what will count as a proof of God's existence. Maybe I can show you why. Somebody comes up to me on the street and says, Dr. Bonson, you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Can you prove that there's a God? I say, yeah, I can prove that there's a God. Let me do so. Now, I've written the first premise up here on the screen. I hope most of you at least can see it. I'll try to write a little bit larger. My first premise is nothing exists or God exists. Real quickly, you need to understand that in logic, as I'm using it here anyway, the word or is being used in terms of loose inclusion, not exclusive. Wait, that isn't to say either nothing exists or God exists, one or the other, but at least one of those is true. At least one of those is true. So that if I say, it's Friday evening, or the cow jumped over the moon, then I've spoken the truth. Because it is Friday evening. A cow may not have jumped over the moon, but what I said is, it's Friday evening or the cow jumped over the moon. As long as one of those is true, one of those claims is true, then an A or B form statement will itself be true. So, nothing exists or God exists is where I'm beginning, and I've interpreted for you, or in that loose sense. At least one of these is true. Nothing exists or God exists. Now, I can add a second premise to this, and that's that something exists. All right? Now, if it's true that nothing exists or God exists, meaning at least one of those claims must be true, and if I say that something exists, and that is, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go through all the sophistication necessary to show you this, but I think in common parlance, you understand that contradicts the idea that nothing exists, right? Is anybody having any trouble yet? If so, we've got real trouble. <laughs> what I'm saying here is, when I say something exists, that's contradicting the idea that nothing exists. But, remember, if my first premise is true, when I say nothing exists or God exists, one of those claims must be true, and I know the first one isn't, because something does exist, then what am I going to conclude? All right, budding students in logic, what is the conclusion now? God exists. Exactly. Okay, I guess we can put our things away and go home. I did it. I proved God exists. There you have it. Nothing exists or God exists. Something exists, and therefore God exists. You know, what I find fascinating is that you can't see everybody's face, but I can, and I don't see anybody who's impressed. Not a one of you, really, is, and I don't see anybody's jaw dro you know, dropping. You know, the light is dawning. And you say, well, that, that isn't impressive at all. And I say, well, no, wait a minute. When you ask me for a uh, proof of God's existence, what do you want? Do you want a sound proof? Do you want a sound argument for God's existence? Now, many of you may have had some philosophy classes, or a, a class at least in elementary logic, and you know what is required for a sound proof? Well, you must have true premises and formal validity in terms of the relationship of those premises. That is, if the premises are true, and if the logical laws used to move from one to another to the conclusion are all valid, then you've got a sound argument. Now, let's begin with that logical part. Is this a valid argument? It's called disjunctive syllogism. It's certainly valid. 
give A or B, not A, therefore B. And any time you have an argument that uses that form of argumentation, if the premises are true, you can count on the conclusion being true, of necessity. So it's valid as the form. You say, yeah, but then how about the truth of the premises? Huh? Well, let's begin with two. Anybody have trouble with two? Something exists. Well, you know, there are some strange philosophers, really, <laughs> really strange philosophers, who might have some trouble with that, but as far as, you know, what you're going to be dealing with, most people are going to say, yeah, something exists. Remember Descartes? You know, if I can doubt everything in the world, at least I can't doubt that I'm doubting. At least doubting exists. Of course, that's Bertrand Russell's correction of Descartes. Descartes said, I exist if I doubt. Russell said, oh no, all you proved is that doubting exists. So something exists. Most people are willing to say something exists. Well, how about that first premise? Is it true nothing exists or God exists? Well, if God exists, it's true, isn't it? If God exists, then the premise is true. All right, we've already said the second premise is true. We've been a little quick about it, but we're granting the second one is true. We've already said that the form of the argument is valid, and so we must conclude... If God exists, this is an argument for God's existence. It's a sound argument for God's existence. Now, by pulling your leg a bit and doing this, I can get to what I think is an important point. And that's that when most people ask for a proof of God's existence, they don't know what they're asking for. Because if all they wanted was proof in that simple, elementary, logical sense, I've given you a proof. Just as long as God exists, this argument shows that he exists. Because the premises are true, the form is valid, and so it's a sound argument. I want to suggest to you that what most people want is not a sound argument for God exists, but a convincing argument that God exists. Isn't that right? They don't want something like this. Something exists or God exists. And I mean, nothing exists or God exists, and because something exists, therefore God exists. They want something that's going to be convincing. Now then, in order to have a convincing argument that God exists, before we can judge any candidate to being a convincing argument, we're going to have to know what a convincing argument would be. And this was, begins to get us into some heavy going philosophy, the sort of stuff that I really enjoyed. I specialized in epistemology in my doctoral work and that sort of thing. And so I enjoy this, but it's more than just a matter of entertainment. This is crucial. Because when the unbeliever demands a convincing argument, or when natural theologians say they can provide a convincing argument, we'd better know what they're talking about. What would be a convincing argument? Well, I want to suggest to you that a convincing argument will be one where the form of the argument is valid. We've already covered that in our elementary discussion. The form of the argument is valid. And secondly, the premises are not just true, that's what I talked about in terms of soundness of an argument, the premises are not just true, but they are known, they are known to be true by all men. And let me subdivide this a bit. To say that they are known to be true by all men, I want to clarify, that is to say, each premise is proven, and secondly, proven independently of the conclusion. Okay, let me read this for you. The conditions of a convincing proof are that the form of the argument or the form of the proof is valid, and that the premises used are known to be true by all men. And I mean by that that each premise is proven, and each premise is proven independently of the conclusion. Okay, let's go back to that argument I used. You see the problem why that's not convincing? I said premise one, nothing exists or God exists, is true if God exists. But you see, that's what the conclusion is. So that if I know that God exists, or if I'm willing to grant the truth of the first premise only because I know that God exists already, then I haven't really given you a convincing proof that God exists, because I was dependent upon my conclusion when I accepted that first premise. Y'all follow me? That's not, it's not, there's nothing subtle here. I mean, it's rather basic. 
I only accepted one because I already was convinced about three. And so that took away the convincing nature of the proof. So, we need an argument whose form is valid, premises are known to be true by all men, each premise being proven independently of the conclusion. And I'll be very blunt about it. My evaluation of that demand for a convincing proof is that it's a ridiculously hard task. Ridiculously hard task that is being demanded, and by no means is it practiced elsewhere when men are using their minds. Ridiculously hard task. And the only reason people push it is because they're so prejudiced against the existence of God in the first place. But that's a psychological observation. It's a ridiculously hard task that is being demanded, and I'd like to show you why. It's unlikely that there's really any conclusion that can be proven convincingly to everyone. It's unlikely that there is any conclusion that can be proven convincingly to everyone. The emphasis in that sentence, you see, is convincingly, where convincingly is defined in this way. The form is valid, premise is known to be true by all men, etc. And I'd like to take just a few minutes, I'm going to keep track of my time, I don't take too many minutes, but I want to take just a few minutes to start showing you what is wrong with this conception of a convincing proof. And we're going to find problems. I'm going to use some Greek notation here just so you can follow it easier. We're going to find problems right here. I'll call this alpha. But the idea that the form must be valid. That demand will have its own difficulties. We'll have difficulties here, beta, with the premises known to be true by all men. We'll have difficulty with the idea that each premise must be proven. We'll call that gamma. And then delta will be that it's known independently of the conclusion. First of all, then, how about this requirement that the form of the proof be valid? When somebody says a convincing argument must have a valid form, that person is assuming that there's agreement on the rules of logic and on the normative status of the rules of logic. And though it may seem heretical in a freshman class on logic to say this, let me tell you from the standpoint of somebody who's done a little bit more work on that, there isn't universal agreement on the laws of logic. There isn't. And, more importantly, even where there is agreement on the laws of logic, there is tremendous disagreement as to their normative status. I'll give you an example. One of the elementary laws of logic called the law of excluded middle. You see, well, there are many systems of logic that reject the law of excluded middle. Indeed, quantum approaches to physics have led people to think that you cannot say that something is true or its opposite is true. And that's because they say something can't be true unless it can be known, and there are some cases where we can't know whether something is true or its opposite. In theory, we can't even know, and so in such cases, the law of excluded middle doesn't hold. Now, you may not be convinced by that. I'm not entirely convinced by it either, but the fact of the matter is not all men agree. Logic isn't this universal field of peace and harmony where everybody sees the light the same way and does the same thing with it. It's just not true. And so to assume agreement on the rules of logic and their normative status is to assume a controversial point, in fact, one that is false. Beyond this, we need to ask, don't the rules of logic need to be proven as well? Each premise is proven. Well, proven by what? If you were to say that your proof was simply that you agreed with it, you'd get laughed out of court, wouldn't you? Well, what's the difference between that and saying, well, but I use the rules of logic. Who is rules of logic? Who says they're normative? So what? Why don't we laugh that out of court? Well, it's because we have greater respect for the rules of logic. But why? You see, that's not just automatic. I mean, you've got to have some kind of foundation for that. There's got to be some kind of argument for that as well. Now, all I'm saying at this point, if, if, if you want to know the bottom line, is that there are arbitrary assumptions in natural theology. And arbitrary assumptions need to be exposed for their arbitrariness. If someone wants to get very hot and bothered about the rules of logic, then they better have a good case for the rules of logic. And by the way, if their case for the rules of logic depends upon the rules of logic, what do we call that? Circular reasoning. And if their case for the rules of logic doesn't depend upon the rules of logic, 
as they're delineated, then the rules of logic aren't necessary, are they? And so that's not just a sophistical problem. What do we do about the foundations of logic? That leads me to my next point. There is no agreement among philosophers about the foundations of logic. You take one of the most elementary questions conceivable about the laws of logic. What is their status? What is a law of logic? Not what are they. There may be, you know, a lot of agreement on that, not universal, but there may be a lot of agreement. But what is a law of logic? Is that an electrochemical process in my mind? Or my brain, to be more precise? Do laws of logic deal with propositions? Are there propositions? Or do they deal only with assertions? Well, we can go on and on. There isn't universal agreement. There's not universal knowledge of the rules of logic, and there's not universal agreement as to what they are and how they should be used and whether they're normative anyway. Let's go to beta here. Not only is this definition of a convincing proof flawed at the first requirement, the second requirement, that the premises are known to be true by all men, is ridiculous. Because knowledge and ingenuity vary from person to person. Knowledge and ingenuity vary from person to person. There are some people who don't know what you think any intelligent person should know. There are some people in your own school, by the way. I went to school with people who didn't catch on to a lesson, and yet they may have gotten good grades and may have passed school and so forth, but they may never have learned something. So they don't know something that I know. Not all men, not even all intelligent men, know the same thing. And so you know what's going to happen here? An implicit prejudice is going to come into play. First of all, there's going to be an implicit prejudice as to the rules of logic that I talked about a moment ago. The rules of logic must be taught. They must be taught in order to use them our way. You see, when I've talked to logic professors who aren't Christians about another approach to these things, what they usually do, instead of giving you an, a rational answer, is they laugh it out and say, well, that's not the Western approach to logic. You read a book on Buddhist logic and then try to talk to one of your Western professors about it, and he'll say, well, that's not logic as we do it. Okay, so what? I mean, that's supposed to settle it, right? And you say, well, people in Western universities don't ask Buddhists to give lectures on logic. So I guess they, they obviously, that's kind of like defining them out of existence, right? There's no such thing as Buddhist logic because they never give papers at our conferences. So there. <laughs> Nobody comes out and says that, but that's what it amounts to. There's an implicit prejudice that logic must be done our way and understood to have the significance that we teach our freshmen that it has. Or more generally now, number two is ridiculous, I think, because if you just look at knowledge in general and not just knowledge of logic, we will have to define who an intelligent or properly educated person is. Since not everybody knows the same things as everybody else, when we say, well, you know, the argument that you're using here wouldn't even be understood by an aborigine in Australia, then the person say, oh, well, what, what I meant is all properly educated men know these things. Oh, properly educated, or all intelligence men know these things. Well, you don't have to be prodded much more. You know what the next problem is going to be. Well, who says who's properly educated and who's intelligent? Usually the wielder of the argument, which only goes to show that we have an implicit prejudice here. And so the universality feature here, the premises must be known to be true by all men, the universality feature demanded is unrealistic and is not satisfied by any proposition that is used as a conclusion. And in that case, we have no fixed termination point for a convincing argument. No fixed termination point. We rather have a person-relative termination point. Let me explain that. It's not as though we know at a particular point that settles it, that makes it convincing because all men know the premises and the form is valid. No, what you have to say is, for the people to whom I'm speaking, they know the premises. Or I know the premises. It's person relative. This person to whom I'm speaking knows the premises to be true and the form is valid. It's not a fixed and universal point of termination for 
A uh, convincing argument is rather one that is relative. Now, once we say that it is relative, we have to add this if we're going to be honest. Reaching a convincing point in your argument may not be a virtue. Because convincing is relative to the person to whom I'm speaking. And I want to assure you that when my son was four years old, I could convince him of things. All of my children are older than that, and they're often showing their poor dad up. But when they were four years old, I could beat them. But you see, convincing a child of something is not necessarily a virtue. Not necessarily. And there are also people, not just children. I told you about intellectual bullying. I've seen this happen in classrooms. Professors bully students into saying and believing things, and I'm not sure that's always a virtue, that they've convinced them of something. On the other hand, not reaching a point of conviction with an individual may not be a defect either. It may not be a defect that the person with whom I'm arguing will not be convinced because that may be more a reflection upon that person's lack of knowledge or ingenuity or ability to use logic, whatever it may be. It could just be a reflection on the person and not a reflection upon my argument. All right. What we have then in this first requirement that the form is valid is a concealed prejudice. Something There's a lot more talk about the foundations of logic that's going to have to be done before that's going to stand. Secondly, the premise of having to be known to be true by all men is unrealistic because knowledge and ingenuity vary from person to person. Let's go down to this next level. When we say that each premise must be proven, we've got a problem as well. Because you see, nobody can construct an infinite series of proof for each premise. Let me illustrate. Let's say that I have a premise, I'm just going to call it A, and I have another premise, B, and they are used in an argument for whatever it may be, the number of ants in Ethiopia for that matter, or the existence of God. But it's an argument, I say, and A and B are necessary to this argument. But each of these premises must be proven. And so A is going to be proven, I say, by looking at C. And B is going to be proven by looking at D. What now will we have to do? Well, we'll have to have a proof for C and D, too, won't we? Okay, no problem. So I, because I'm pretty, I have a lot of ingenuity. So... I'm going to prove C by E and D by F. We taking care of the problem? No. Because now E's got to be proven. And then F. And I'm not going to waste your time going on and on. I hope you got the point. It's just going to go on and on and on and on. If each premise must be proven convincingly, then that means what I was doing with A and B, I must do with C and D, then E and F, and on and on and on and on. And what's wrong with that? Well, I think there's three things wrong with that. First of all, just forgetting some philosophical difficulties and epistemological problems with infinite regress, none of us has enough time to give an infinite number of arguments. You may have noticed your lifespan is limited. Okay? And in a limited lifespan, you cannot give an unlimited number, number of arguments. None of us has enough time. By the way, none of us has enough time on one premise to prove the grounds of that premise, and then to prove the grounds of the grounds, and then the grounds of the grounds, and the grounds and the grounds and the grounds of the grounds of the grounds. It goes on and on and on for one premise. And remember, we've got two. It's going to take two infinities to do this. And of course, if you have a complicated argument, like many books in the philosophy of religion, you may have 47, 48 premises. No one has enough time to do that. So when, when you demand as a convincing argument that each premise is proven in this way, then it's unreachable. This can't be done. Besides, argumentation would not be possible. Couldn't even get started without a given foundation. A starting point which is not likewise directly proven by independent consideration. You see, if I never get back to a starting point in this regress of argument, then none of my arguments get started, really. I may get started talking, but none of the arguments get started because none of them has a starting point 
And so nobody, thirdly, can gain all of his knowledge by convincing argument. This is something which, now that we've analyzed it, I hope you can see how obvious it is, nobody can gain all of the knowledge that he or she has. No one can gain all of his knowledge by convincing argument. Remember, we're convincing arguments being used in this technical sense. Nobody can. And if that's true, that means some of the things we know, we know apart from convincing proof. Now, which of those things that we know should be given this privileged status? Which of those things which we should give the privileged status of being exempt from convincing argumentation? This leads me to the last series of criticisms, the delta level of criticisms, that our premises must be known to be true by all men independently of the conclusion. Well, but you see, perhaps the conclusion in this particular case is one of our privileged propositions, in which case it's wrong to demand, in this case, a convincing proof. Or secondly, it may just be, and this is what I will try to argue tomorrow night, it just may be that my conclusion that God exists is itself necessary for knowing the other propositions in the first place. It's not just that it's one of the privileged propositions, that I know, but that it is the foundational proposition for all the rest. The first thing we've seen then in our consideration of natural theology is that the demand for a convincing proof is unrealistic. It's ridiculously hard to offer a convincing argument as convincing argument has been defined, and it's unlikely that there's any conclusion that can be proven convincingly to everyone. And so if that's the case, why demand it when it comes to the existence of God? All right, a second line of argumentation won't be nearly as complicated or as long. I have some theological problems with this notion of natural theology as well. And I'll, I'll put this second criticism in the form of a question, rhetorical to be sure, but I want to ask, is it the living God or an idol which is proved is it the living God or an idol which is proved by something that is more certain than God and something which is known independently of God? If there is something by which I could prove God's existence, that something by which I prove it would be more certain than God's existence and could be known independently of God's existence, if you follow natural theological ideals. But if something is more certain in God's existence and known independently of God's existence, I want to suggest to you it's not the living God whose existence we're talking about. That natural theology is not what we're talking about. We're talking about natural idolatry. Because we're making something, we're giving something a more privileged status and more authority, more epistemic certainty and independence than God himself. Moreover, in terms of what natural theology is trying to accomplish, this is the third line of difficulty or criticism that I have with it. Natural theology holds that partial elements of the truth, that A, God exists, partial elements of the truth about theism can be reached at the end of an autonomous reasoning process. It's partial elements known at the end of a reasoning process, but as I read the Bible, Scripture says it's the full truth that is objectively visible from the very start of the reasoning process. Natural theology has things turned exactly inside out. It's not partial elements of the truth known at the end, it's the full truth known at the beginning. The unbeliever has not done justice to the objective and true revelation of God if his rejection, or excuse me, if his reaction to the evidence is not God-fearing from the very outset. Secondly, natural theologians, natural theologians think that the unbeliever can be fair, open-minded, and have a right use of reason, can make a correct use of reason, and that when he does so, he will affirm a portion of religious truth upon the strength of the evidence. But what does Scripture say? Scripture views the unbeliever not as having a fair, open mind who uses reason rightly. Scripture views the unbeliever as prejudiced against God, indeed hating God. 
closed-minded, hard-hearted, suppressing the truth, deceiving himself, and desperately wicked. One that Paul says is an enemy in his mind who cannot submit to the law of God and is thus vain and uses blinded reasoning. By the way, none of that was written by Dr. Bonson. Every bit of that, this description, you'll find written in the Bible of the unbeliever's mind in his thinking. And so at the end of the reasoning process, if there's not gracious and saving repentance, the Bible says you'll find nothing but criminal distortion of the truth and culpable ignorance. Natural theologians have a Pollyanna view of sin, a Pollyanna view of sinners, and the way sinners think. And I don't care how good a front your professor puts up, that, oh, I'm willing to hear a proof if anybody would have it. The Bible says in his heart of hearts he hates God. He will not willingly come into the presence of God and confess his sin and bow and give up his autonomy. It just doesn't happen. You see, Scripture teaches the necessity of the Holy Spirit's work if blinded eyes are going to see the truth. And by the way, I want to add very quickly so I'm not misunderstood, the Holy Spirit does not make bad arguments good by changing hearts. The Holy Spirit takes away resistance to good arguments. It's just that the arguments we're thinking about here, cosmological argument and others used by natural theologians, are not good arguments in the first place. But the Bible says Scripture teaches that the Holy Spirit must change the heart even if you have a good argument. And the Bible goes on to say when the Holy Spirit changes the heart, he makes to submit to the whole truth of God, not bits and pieces of it, and the Holy Spirit doesn't lead a person to say, well, probably there's a God. You know what an insult that is to the Almighty to say, well, probably you exist. You know, there's no question, of course, that I do, and probably you do. You know, nobody that has a changed heart could really self-consciously do that sort of thing. The Holy Spirit, when he changes our hearts, does not lead us to say probably, but rather, as we saw in terms of Abraham, with full assurance to say, absolutely, God exists. And I'm answerable to him. So what have I said thus far? Let me go back and recap. This idea of a proof in natural theology is very suspect to me. The notion of a convincing proof is not really available. I mean is not followed for anything else. Secondly, I'm not sure it's the living God that's being proven, but rather an idol. Thirdly, natural theology is minimal in its goals, misdirected in the way it strives after them, and unrealistic about the nature of man. And fourthly, I think there's two special methodological errors that we can pull out about natural theology two special errors methodologically. The first is the natural theologians grant autonomy to the unbeliever in his thinking process. And the second methodological error is that natural theology assumes that somebody needs a proof of God's existence. Let me pursue each one of those. You know, the method by which we defend the Christian message needs to be consistent with the message itself. Shouldn't that be obvious? That if we are defending the faith in a way that runs counter to what the faith teaches, then we aren't defending the faith. Our method must be adjusted to our message. Therefore, if the theistic proofs make improper assumptions, remember lying to defend the truth, if the theistic proofs make improper assumptions, it's imperative that we recognize that and not reason in their fashion. If we misrepresent the message of Scripture, by arguing in a way that's unfitting for a Christian, and yet we get assent from the unbeliever, we may have confirmed the unbeliever in his rebellion against God rather than work toward his conversion. It's for these reasons that we must avoid the use of what traditionally are called the theistic proofs. The very method of the proofs concedes the point which we want to refute, the autonomy of the sinner. That's so important, I'm going to repeat it. I hope that if you're taking notes, you'll get this down, if nothing else. The very method of the traditional proofs concedes the point we wish to refute, and that's the autonomy, the intellectual autonomy of the sinner. The so-called theistic proofs are not simply wrong in point. I'm going to show that in a few moments, but they are wrong from the bottom up. They are inherently unfit for use by the Christian apologist. 
And so out of concern for the salvation of men's souls and the proper glory which is due for God and our witness, we must reject the arguments for God's existence which pattern themselves after the historical use of the theistic proofs. The autonomous reasoning which forms the foundation for the historical use of the theistic proofs assumes that man is the final and ultimate reference point of reasoning and learning, and that man's mind is the interpretive arbiter of the truth. And in opposition to this, the Christian affirms that God alone is the final reference point for intelligibility and reasoning. God alone is the final interpreter of every fact, because he's the creator of every fact. By contrast to the non-Christian way of thinking, the Christian reasons by thinking God's thoughts after him. That is, in terms of God's revelation, whereas the non-Christian says that's unnecessary. The historic theistic proofs allow God into the universe only by making him less than God. And so let me quote one of the better apologists of the 20th century, Cornelius Van Til. Dr. Van Til writes in his book, The Defense of the Faith, in not challenging this basic presupposition with respect to himself, as the final reference point in predication, the natural man may accept the theistic proofs as fully valid. He may construct such proofs. He has constructed such proofs. But the God whose existence he proves to himself in this way is always a God who is something other than the self-contained ontological trinity of Scripture. He wants to prove the existence of such a God as will leave intact the autonomy of man to at least some extent. Let me quote him in another place in the defense of the faith. Van Til says, The knowledge of God is inherent in man. It is there by virtue of its creation in the image of God. This may be called innate knowledge. God made man a rational moral creature. He will always be that. As such, he is confronted with God. He is addressed by God. He exists in the relationship of covenant interaction. He is a covenant being. To not know God, man would have to destroy himself. He cannot do this. There is no non-being into which man can slip in order to escape God's face and voice. The mountains will not cover him. Hades will not hide him. Nothing can prevent his being confronted with him with whom we have to do. Whenever he sees himself, he sees himself confronted with God. Those are rather strong words Van Til gives us. He says, there's no one who needs a proof of God's existence because all men know God and all men are constantly confronted by God. Of course, Van Til has not made this up himself. This is what Paul tells us in Romans, the first chapter. Paul says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known of God. Notice he says, first of all, it's known. Not something that's a hypothesis. Not something which can be known if they'll just use their reason correctly. He says it is known of God is manifest in them for God manifested it unto them. For the invisible things of him since the creation of the world are very probably seen, almost seen, vaguely seen, no, clearly seen, being perceived through the things that are made, even his everlasting power and divinity, in order that they may be without excuse. On the day of judgment, no man will say, God, you see, the problem is there were some difficulties in this argument that the theist was trying to show me, and he never got them worked out before I died. And so, please be gentle when you judge me, because I have some excuse for my unbelief. Let me tell you, God will say what Paul says, you have no excuse. Now stop and think about that. Yeah. I've been through this process. Now, I've seen some of the best in the evangelical world try to come up with their theistic proofs, and they're still working on them. It's still a tough thing. And not many people go that far in their education. Not many people have exposure to these people. Even if you said they had good arguments, and I don't think they have good arguments, but even if you said they did, how many people in the history of mankind have had the benefit of learning in a philosophy class from one of those evangelical teachers that had this alleged good argument for God's existence? Paul says you don't have to go to a college 
for the Christian professor that uses natural theological proof. All men are completely without excuse because they know me. Because that knowing God, they glorified him not as God, neither gave thanks, but became vain in their reasoning and their senseless heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. God says in Romans 1, through Paul, that all men know him and suppress the truth and unrighteousness. They know him, and because they suppress the truth, they are led into intellectual foolishness, moral foolishness as well. The fact is they become fools, and their senseless hearts are darkened, and they become vain in their reasoning. And so I ask you, who needs a theistic proof in the sense that natural theology is talking about? Paul says no one needs a theistic proof. Unbelievers will continue to throw water on an inward fire which they can't possibly quench, the knowledge of God. They know God. They were made by God. They were made in the image of God. They constantly confront God in the natural world. And they have that fire burning there, and they'll throw water and bucket after bucket of bucket of water upon it, but they will never quench it. Man has been created to know God. And God doesn't fail in his endeavors. If he made man to know him, you can be sure man does know him, whatever man says about it. Of course, the natural man doesn't have this conception of himself. He will not readily admit that this is the case. But that's precisely the point. He's trying to suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And it's important that our outlook and conceptions be formed by the truth of God's inscripturated revelation. It alone can properly assess the sickness of men. You see, in Scripture, the great physician diagnoses the state of all men, and he doesn't ask the patient to diagnose himself. The patient's not in a position to say what is truly ailing him. That's why he is the patient. When the patient disagrees with the great physician, do you think the doctor should stop and try as he may to convince the patient on the patient's own terms? Of course not. If the patient is to be cured, he must face the facts as the physician describes them and on the physician's terms. The natural man will not admit that he is a creature made in the image of God and that he knows God personally, yet this is not the biblical conception of the situation at all. The Bible says all men do know God. In fact, Psalm 36 verse 9 says, And by light we see light. No man can see light, can be enlightened or know anything apart from the light of God. In thy light we see light. John 1.9 tells us that Christ is the one who coming into the world enlightens every man. In Psalm 19 verses 1 to 3, well-known passage, we learn that all of creation is eloquent testimony to the knowledge of God. Even where there is no voice, their testimony is known. Whether it be the stars, the sea, anything in creation, God is known by the unbeliever. So then, who might the theistic proofs be intended for? No one needs to have the existence of God proved to him. He rather needs to have his alienation removed. He needs to be exposed for what he's doing, suppressing the truth. That is to say, the unbeliever needs to have the mask torn off his face by which he's pretending not to know God. We don't go and say, well, let's play this game that your mask represents and see if that'll get the mask off. We go rather and we say, you're wearing a mask. We need to take it off. Now, what does that all refer to? That refers to using a form of argumentation that will demonstrate that you know God and you couldn't know anything else apart from him. And so, rather than concede the numerous points the natural theology concedes the presupposition which says we need to go to the heart of the matter and argue that without God you couldn't prove anything at all. Well, I have just a few more minutes here with you this evening, and what I'd like to do in our remaining time is talk about one of the most popular of the theistic proofs that natural theologians have set forth, and that's the cosmological argument. The cosmological argument, as I introduced it to you a few minutes ago, suggests that there has to be a cause for this world, and that's what we call God. There has to be a cause for this world, and that's what we call God. Okay? Every event has a cause, 
This world is an event. This world has a cause. Okay. Does that prove that it's a non-natural cause? No, it doesn't. You see, if I go to the natural world and I say, I'm convinced by looking at the way nature operates, that every event has a cause, and therefore the world as a whole, as an event, must have a cause, then one would, it seems to me, reasonably suspect that that cause is a natural cause. Because it's the natural world that's given us the foundation for the premise that every event has a cause. But you see, natural theologians don't reason that way, which is really the only thing they could prove. They argue that the world must have a non-natural cause. Oh, and it's much more than that, because you see, if every event has a cause, then the child's question, who then caused God, calls for an answer. And at this point, natural theologians are, look, are always looking for ways in which to make God, you see, the uncaused cause. Uh, the philosopher Schopenhauer had, a, I think, a, a cute way of dealing with that. He said, you know, the causal principle can't be employed like a taxi to take you as far as you want and then to get out. Okay, so I use this causal principle. Every event has to have a cause, all right? So where did I come from? I came from my parents. Where did my parents come from? Back, 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 back. Where did Adam and Eve come from? Well, if you believe in evolution, they evolved from the dust. I don't believe in that nonsense. But they either evolved from the dust, and then you have a question where did the dust come from, or they came from the hand of God. But then what's the question? Where did God come from? You can't leave the causal principle now just because it's brought you to the point you want. And so what has to be added to the cosmological argument? Well, it's an interesting thing. I'm going to inform you of a book that was published in this last year entitled Classical Apologetics, A Rational Defense of the Christian Faith and Critique of Presuppositional Apologetics by R.C. Sproul, John Gerstner, and Arthur Lindsley. Now, in this book, the attempt is made to rescue the cosmological argument and others, an attempt to rescue natural theology and to criticize presuppositional theology. And so... It's interesting to me, I, I believe it was Sproul who would have been the writer of this particular section, but whether it's Sproul or not, we'll just use his name as one of the authors. Sproul tells us that people don't understand this law of causality that's being used in the cosmological argument. And why is it they don't understand it? He says because it's true by definition. It doesn't do any good to attack this law of causality because it must be true. Because what the law of causality maintains is that every effect has a cause. Now, those of you who haven't already fallen asleep or gotten muddled by this point will say, now that isn't what Dr. Bronson was saying a minute ago. When he gave the argument, he said every event has a cause. Sproul now says you can't attack that premise because every effect has a cause, and that's true by definition. Right, it is true by definition. Every effect does have a cause. And then what's the question going to become? Is the world an effect? Not is the world an event, or is the world defined by events, but is the world an effect? And is it? The interesting thing is to ask that question is just to start all over again, isn't it? To ask whether the world is an effect is to ask whether God made the world, or something else made it, and then God made that something else, but we'll simplify it and say, we're asking, did God make the world? To say that the cosmological argument is going to be rescued by making the law of causality true by definition, this is just throw out the proof altogether. Because you're begging the question. Well now, Sproul doesn't seem to recognize that at some points, but elsewhere where he comes close to doing so, he says that something has to have the power of being in it. And maybe you can tell me later. I'm not sure what the power of being might be. I have no idea what that language is except the pseudo-sophisticated way to sound intelligent. The power of being? Okay, and what Sproul does, you see, is it goes like this. His argument is found on... I'll find the proper page here for and read it for you. His argument is found on page 115. And he says, the simplest version argues that if something exists now, something exists necessarily. If something is, if anything is, 
something must have the power of being within itself. And then he goes on to say, you grant that something exists. Here's this molecule, okay? Well, now, he says, there are four possible explanations or sufficient reasons for the molecule. And he's going to give the four, and he's going to go through the first three and say they're no good, and the fourth one, the only one left, is that God made the molecule. But now, before he gets that far, the discerning reader will say, why does there have to be a sufficient reason for the molecule? To say that there must be a sufficient reason is to beg the question as to whether the molecule, what, is an effect. Now, Sproul says, you could say it's an illusion. Well, we're not going to worry with that. Or that it's self-created. He says, oh, ha, ha, that can't be true, because then it's an effect that caused itself, and that's ridiculous. And then he comes to the idea that it's self-existent. He doesn't want to buy that either. It can't be self-existent, because if it were, it would have the power of being in it. If it has the power of being in it, then it's God. And lo and behold, we've proven that God exists. You see, all this is nothing more but verbal shenanigans. There's no proof of anything in this. What Sproul has done, of course, is that he's confused a number of things. In the first place, he's confused the idea that if something exists, then it exists necessarily, or that something exists necessarily. Moreover, he's confused two things, that it's a necessary truth that X exists, is confused with X exists necessarily. That is, it's a mode of its existence. And having done that, the only thing left for Sproul to do to rescue himself is to say, when you look around you, everything in this world is contingent, isn't it? And if everything in this world is contingent, then this world is contingent, and it can't be the necessary being. Well, you see, that create, that's one of the most fundamental errors in logic. It's called the fallacy of composition. That what's true of the parts must be true of the whole. That is not a valid form of argument. Sproul quotes another philosopher, and he says, An infinite series of contingent beings will be, to my way of thinking, as unable to cause itself as one contingent being. So, if you add up contingent beings to infinity, you still get contingent beings not a necessary being. Well, I want you to stop and think about this. Do you know what Legos are? The parents in the crowd do, I know, because your children need Legos. You probably are an abusive parent if you haven't got Legos for your children. <laughs> All right, these little Legos, you see, these little plastic things that are, you know, made so they fit into each other. Well, in a shopping center near my home, somebody made, I don't know, there must have been three million Legos in this thing. This huge ship made out of Legos. Okay? Now, as I looked at that ship and considered what it took to move it, I thought to myself, you know, that ship is not very heavy. And you know how I proved that? I said, because I've picked up a Lego before and it's not very heavy. Now, here's one Lego, and it's not very heavy. The next Lego is not very heavy. The next Lego is not very heavy. The next Lego on to three million Legos, and therefore the whole thing must not be very heavy. Does that convince you? Well, how's this argument sound? Well, this thing is contingent, and this thing is contingent, and this thing is contingent, so the whole thing must be contingent. You see, the properties of the parts are not necessarily the property of the whole. And yet that is what one must argue when he says this whole world is contingent, made up of contingent things, so it is contingent, so there must be a necessary being that we call God that caused it. Well, I mean, we're, we're just looking at fallacy after fallacy after fallacy in this reasoning. The cosmological argument does not prove a first cause, unless you beg the question, of course. It does not prove that there is a cause for everything. Well, I don't think I want to get into anything further with you or else our question time is going to be cut down even more drastically than it already has been. I'd like to summarize what we have done this evening. We first of all looked at the aim of apologetics so that we know why we're here at this conference and what we're trying to accomplish at it. And then in the second hour, I introduced you briefly to two approaches to how we might prove the existence of God.
The presuppositional approach we'll spend time with tomorrow evening. Tonight we looked at natural theology, and I suggested to you that the proofs of God's existence in natural theology are trying to satisfy a demand for convincing proof which is unrealistic. Secondly, that what is being proven is not God, but rather an idol, an idol that is thought to be more certain than God and independent of God. Thirdly, that natural theology is minimal in what's trying to accomplish, only a God probably exists, is misdirected in the way that it wants to do it, saying that God comes in at the end of a reasoning process and is unrealistic about the nature of man, not seeing how much he hates God and will not come to know God in his own natural strength. Fourthly, two key methodological errors were isolated. First, the error of granting autonomy to the unbeliever so that we don't intellectually challenge him from the outset. Secondly, assuming that somehow proof is needed by somebody rather than unmasking that person of suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And then fifthly, very briefly at the end, I tried to take an example from the cosmological argument to show you how those arguments just don't have philosophical strength. You cannot prove God's existence in the way that the natural theologians have attempted to do so. But I don't want to leave you on that despairing note because I believe there's an absolutely sound and convincing proof for the existence of God. Where I will now define convincing as what will shut the mouth of unbelievers and leave them without excuse before the truth. I already told you I can't change hearts. But we can give an objectively valid argument for God's existence, and basically the proof is that without him, you can't prove anything. So that even the unbeliever who is using his reason and trying to argue against Christianity, the unbeliever in all of that is assuming God's existence even while he tries to disprove it. And if I can show that to you tomorrow night, then I trust I will have strengthened your hand when it comes to evangelizing the world. And that desperately needs to be done. Well, let me give you a few moments here. We'll go a little bit over time so that you have opportunity to ask whatever questions you have. And I promise you tomorrow night to give you a, a, a better period for that down here. The question is, doesn't Romans 1 itself show us that the cosmological argument is a good thing to pursue because Paul says God's invisible attributes have been seen through the things which are made? And I would say, no, it doesn't appear to me that Paul is endorsing the cosmological argument at all because he's not endorsing any argument in Romans 1. What Paul says is, totally apart from the discursive use of a step-by-step -step argument or reasoning process, all men know God. Paul doesn't say, the materials are there which, if properly put into syllogistic form, men can see the conclusion that God exists. Let me draw a distinction here. I would suggest that what Paul is saying is not that God is known, no, let me put it this way. Paul is saying God is known directly in the creation, and not that the creation gives us what is necessary to take steps to know God. Now, you're shaking your head. I hope that is clear enough to you. Let me just try to say something for those of you who are saying, what's he talking about up there? I'm saying that as men look at the natural world, Paul says, in looking at the natural world, they immediately know God. And not that in looking at the natural world, they start asking questions, and, and then they start forming arguments and putting steps together in a proof, and then they say, oh, you know what? After all these years of study, finally, that must mean there's a God. See, Paul doesn't suggest anything about a proof of God's existence. He rather says God is revealed. And revelation need not come in the form of discursive Step one, step two, step three. What Paul says is God is known immediately and directly by all men. Now, I want to argue in a way that I don't usually. I think I can prove that exegetically as well. But the simpler way for right now might simply be to ask you, if Paul is endorsing the cosmological argument, which version of it is he endorsing? And is it true that every man has been able to use and has used that cosmological argument to come and know God? Gordon Clark used to write of Sophie the Washwoman, I, I think it was Clark who wrote of this person as, as the very opposite of the philosophically minded person. I want to ask you, does Sophie the Washwoman know the cosmological argument? Is that what Paul is claiming there? Is that really what he's saying there? Nobody in his right mind would think that Paul is endorsing some sophisticated form of the cosmological argument known to such few people as, say, Father Copleston. 
you know, the, the history of philosophy expert. No, I think what Paul says is all men immediately know God. And then what they do is they go about forming arguments to get away from it. Not, they have the raw materials for a knowledge of God. He says it's an accomplished fact. They know him and are without excuse. Another question? The question is, in C.S. Lewis's Mere Christianity, where in the opening chapters he used basically what is a moral argument for God's existence, the question is whether the Holy Spirit has ever used that to break down a person's resistance and put them in the process of coming to acknowledge God. And I think the answer is yes, Holy Spirit has. And I, I want to follow that up with two other remarks or observations about that. First, the Holy Spirit is able to use some very bad arguments to accomplish some good purposes. Okay, or as Warfield used to say, God can strike a straight blow with a crooked stick. Okay, so the fact that some people may have had C.S. Lewis's argument influence them to come to him doesn't in itself prove that that's a good argument. However, I want to add immediately that I happen to think but that's fairly good piece of literature and something that I like to put into the hands of people. And tomorrow night when we talk about presuppositionalism, I'd like to show why that is. That although Lewis elsewhere didn't operate as a consistent presuppositionalist by any means, I do believe that in mere Christianity, the moral argument is very close to something that a presuppositionalist would use when he says, you know in your heart of hearts this is a God because you use moral concepts and that can only be accounted for in terms of God himself. So all that taken into account, the answer is yes. Another question, way back there. Okay, the question is, uh, references made to old Princeton, Princeton before it became a liberal seminary, uh, in old Princeton, men like Hodge and Warfield used a historical argument for the resurrection of Jesus Christ and then why is it that I am painting it as though it's presuppositional of or natural theology, why are we omitting the historical argument in that approach? First of all, presuppositionalism is not contrary to the use of historical reasoning or the historical proofs for God, uh, or specifically the truth of Christianity. In fact, Van Til says in his 1955 Defense of the Faith that he would use the proof you know, of, of Christ's resurrection. It's just that his colleagues at the seminary do it so much better than he does. He concentrates in more philosophical areas. So he's not against that. However, both the natural theologians and the presuppositionalists understand something which apparently most historical apologists don't, and that's that the historical argument is only good within a certain philosophical framework. You see, if you demonstrate as a historian, which by the way I think the argument that Montgomery and, and others use is, is really a very bad argument, if I wanted to be critically minded, a very bad argument. But even if I forgot that, and I said, well, you've shown to me that the cadaver of this one called Jesus resuscitated. That wouldn't prove that God exists. That would just prove that there's some very strange things that happen in the natural world. And we have yet to discover why that happens. But give us time, you know, the old eschatological cop-out of the naturalist. Give us time and we'll be able to explain it. The historical argument, you see, where it is valuable is only valuable within a certain philosophical framework. And the argument cannot itself establish that framework. You see, you can't say, somebody rose from the dead, therefore there's a God. Somebody could say, somebody rose from the dead, therefore naturally some dead come back to life. You see, and so you're going to have presuppositions that enter in there. So remember that presuppositionalists are not against the use of historical argumentation. And secondly, that historical argumentation must take a subordinate position, I think, to philosophical apologetics in the presuppositional argument. But that doesn't mean that everybody you come up to is going to need the presuppositional argument that I'll be talking about tomorrow night. Theoretically, I could run into somebody on the street who says, yes, I believe that there's a God, I believe in providence, I believe in creation, so forth and so on, and the only thing that keeps me from becoming a Christian is I'm just not sure about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, you see, I wouldn't at that point say, well, now what we need to do, you see, is go back and look at the presuppositions and all that. I might do that, but it seems to me far more profitable to say, well, if that's all it takes, let me show you some things here, you know? Uh, liars don't become martyr, right? These people believed in the resurrection, and they were willing to die for it. Now, what do you think of that? You know, and give some of these evidences, and if the person said, oh, I see the point, then that's fine. But... You see, there are people, and I studied under a number of them, that are a lot more hardcore than that. 
And they'll go down, they go to the point of saying, they're not sure there is a God, there's a personal God, that you can know anything about this God. And that must be the first point that has to be established. Now let me say one more thing, and that's that you need to remember about the old Princeton approach, that it was not strictly historical. The historical argument was second to the natural theological argument. Old Princeton, Hodge, and Warfield would have said, we first proved that a God exists, by the theistic proofs, basically, and then we show that this is the Christian God and that Jesus is his son by the resurrection or historical argument. So I would say that I have been talking about the old Princeton approach, but only the first step of what it's trying to do. Yeah. I would say that the old Princeton approach was natural theological in the opening stroke of its apologetic, and then it became historical when it came to the distinctively Christian part of it. And again, there is a place for that historical argument, but I'd maintain you can only find a place for it and use it within a presuppositional framework. Okay, we'll take one more question, and I'll have more time tomorrow night. Right. Well, I guess if that person's open to hear the scripture, I would quote the scripture. The scripture tells us that we are by our witness to present a reasoned defense of the hope that is in us. A reasoned defense. All right? The scripture tells us we are to cast down every reasoning that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Titus 1.9 tells us we must be able to confute the gainsayers, or to take away the archaic English, to refute those who contradict the faith. And so the truth of Christianity is not simply a matter of being impressed with the lifestyle of somebody you see, but being driven to the point of saying what they believe is true. You see, if I look at somebody's life, I might look at a Buddhist and say, you know, your lifestyle has many commendable things in it. But I don't believe for a minute what you believe about the universe or about man's place in it and so forth. Likewise, if a Christian says, I'm just going to lead a good life and hope that my unbelieving neighbor respects that, the unbelieving neighbor can respect you for your life without at all being convinced that what you believe is true. And so that's not adequate as an apologetic. Well, you've been a very patient audience with me tonight, letting me go over time like this. I promise not to do it to you tomorrow evening. Please come back and we'll continue this when I will try to tell you now how you can win an argument with an atheist unbeliever tonight.